recording this. So I just did that too. So you're going to see that little thing pop up on the screen probably. Very so good. lots of people are already jumping in and joining us right here at four o'clock because I don't want to miss this conversation. So hello, Geraldine Brooks. Hello, Michael Lewis. Hi, it's great to be here. I wish I was really there, but you know. Michael, welcome to welcome to Virtual Warwick's. Uh, it, no, it's a delight. I, I, it's this is a great excuse to 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 interrogate Geraldine, my old friend, about her new book. I love it. And I was talking to Geraldine in the background, and I'm not sure might have been before my day, but we need to get you to San Diego at some point. Geraldine, we've hosted a few times, but you need to come down to La Jolla and do an event here with us one of these days. We'd love to see you down here in San Diego. You would I host, highly, I highly you would, recommend it. You would host the likes of me. I thought that <laughs> I thought that you only worked in traffic and fine literature. <laughs> So, you know, we, maybe we need maybe, to make an exception, I guess. Make an exception. I'm <laughs> happy to come. Anyway, so it's going to be a great conversation. I'm going to fill a little bit of time just doing a little bit of housekeeping. First of all, we have people joining us from three wonderful independent bookstores, Warwick's being one of them. We are located in La Jolla, San Diego, California. Um, Elliot Bay Books um, customers are here and they are joining us from the Seattle, Washington area and then Book Passage, another great indie with multiple locations in the San Francisco, California um, area. So welcome to all of those customers and thank you all for supporting this event with us. Um, and thank you to Viking for allowing us to host you, Geraldine. We are so pleased that they have put this together. We were talking earlier in the green room, you're actually doing some live events and some virtual, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I know it probably would have been tough to get out here on the West Coast with everything going on, but we love that you're here with us virtually. So thank you. Yeah. Um, hi. <laughs> <laughs> hi, everybody. Um, what? So in the chat, um, I'm going to be putting, and if there's somebody from Elia Bay on here that wants to, if you're not, I'll do it. And Book Passage, I'll link how to order Geraldine's book from us. Some of you have already done that. Warwick's has some signed copies of this jewel left. So if you need a signed copy of that, go ahead and um, click that link and we can ship that to you. If you're in the area of one of our bookstores, pop in and see us. We always love seeing customers inside the store. Um, we're gonna be doing some, Michael's gonna be um, filtering the Q and A too for us. So if you have a question and make sure it's a question, we always love that, pop it into the Q and A button that's at the bottom of your screen. And he will see those questions and pop those to Geraldine as it is fit. So with that, I think I've taken enough airtime here. So let's get the show on the road. I think you all know who Geraldine Brooks is, but she is the author of the Pulitzer Prize winning novel, March, several other international bestsellers. One of my personal favorites being People of the Book. Everything she touches seems to turn to gold and we can't wait for this one too. I just, ah, oh, such a great book. And then Michael Lewis. Um, New York Times bestselling author of many books, most recently The Premonition, and of course, The Big Short, among several others. Um, Michael, uh, esteemed columnist, editor, documentarian, filmmaker, narrator, uh, on and on and on. What is it that you don't do? Um, maybe we'll find out today. <laughs> I, don't do, I don't do very good questions and answers with other authors. <laughs> But, but, but we'll get through it. We'll, we'll get, get through it. this. Anyways, thank you both for being here. Have a great conversation and we'll see you in a little bit. All right. So Geraldine, I'm gonna All take right. charge here. Very good. Just you and me now. Um, so uh, first place, you've already turned it into gold. Your, your, the book is a number three on the New York Times bestseller list coming right out of the gate and you're not named Grisham or, Grisham or King. It's, unbe it's unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, your career is unbelievable to me. And I would just, just tell the audience a little bit about my, my view of your career. When we met, you were, you were a war correspondent basically for the Wall Street Journal. Um, we met when your husband came and knocked on my door and tried to interview me for the, for, for the journal. Tony, and uh, I refused to acknowledge him. It, and you all ended up buying the house next door to ours. And we said so we became neighbors. You became, he really wanted that interview, man. He really wanted that interview. Uh, <laughs> you subsequently became godparents to my child. You've been in my life forever. And I've, I've but I've been, I'm, I want to first talk about your career before we talk about this book. I want to know how and when you figured out that you had both interest in and aptitude for writing historical fiction. I wasn't sure if I did or not, but I had just had a baby and I needed a new gig because I'd been 10 years as a kind of a, what they call a fireman 
uh, in a newsroom, which is the person who's sent off at short notice to cover the worst of times in places in trouble. And that to me was not compatible with having an infant. So uh, I, I was trying to get a freelance gig, say, you know, interviewing George Clooney lying around a swimming pool, but they never thought of me for that. They would just keep calling and saying, do you want to go across the, you know, Hindu Kush with the Pashtun warriors? And I'm like, no, I'm nursing my baby. I do not want to do that. So, so if, if Nathaniel had not come into the picture, if you had not gotten pregnant, do you think you'd still be a correspondent for the Wall Street Journal? Yes, I do. I mean, or, you know, something like that, because I did love every step I took and I thought it was an absolute privilege and a big responsibility to get out there and cover the consequences of American foreign policy as they enacted themselves in people's lives. And it was it was uh, completely uh, absorbing and sometimes horrifying, but always challenging and I, I did love that life you you tell your your novels are a symptom of motherhood <laughs> that, that, that you were doing this because you had to write I did not I didn't know that so all right you had to find another gig how did you but how did you I mean this this is such an exquisite historical novel but you this is your I don't know fifth or sixth what sixth it, one sixth, sixth one yeah so so why do you think you gravitated towards that form because I had an idea in my head. So what happened was I got a I had written two books of nonfiction that were essentially journalists books. And um, the second one got a very nice award in my home country in Australia. It was uh, it came with thirty thousand dollars and the award was to encourage women writers and I was really encouraged and um, I decided to take that money and buy myself some time and explore an idea that had been banging around my head ever since uh, a rare, um, a, a, we had a few rare days off between crises in the Middle East where I was mostly working at that time. We went for a hike in the Peak District and we came across uh, the plague village uh, of Eam and the story of how that village had quarantined itself voluntarily in 1665 when bubonic plague hit. And I'd always been intrigued by what that was like to be in that village during the year of plague. And I decided to sit down and try and write it. And lucky for me, somebody wanted to read it. So I just kept going in that vein. You could have done it, it is a work of nonfiction. No, you couldn't have. And if you could have, I probably would have because I knew how to do that. And I didn't know if I knew how to write a novel, but there wasn't enough. There, there were too many voids. There were too many places where the voices were silent because this was a village of illiterate lead miners and sheep farmers, and they just hadn't left a record of what it was like to be them. So the only way to engage with that material then is through an exercise of empathetic well-informed imagination so that was what I did and that's what I've kept doing did you have when you when you first when you first started out not being sure if you knew what you were doing did you have role models oh yeah uh there was a a, a novelist that I particularly liked that I came across when I was a teenager Mary Renault she's a British author and she wrote about the ancient world and she generally tends to write in first person and inhabits the mind of somebody from that uh, time and place, which is so different and, you know, alien in, in so many ways, but she always managed to draw you into the story because she believed as I do that the emotional life of people hasn't changed that much and the strong emotions of love and hate work exactly the same way in ancient Greece as they work today. So there was a book of hers called The Persian Boy about um, an enslaved Persian uh, youth who ended up being servant and then lover of Alexander the Great. And it's a terrific book. And so I was using that as kind of a model of how to do it. Yeah. Did you, like, what were the occupational hazards? What were you worried about getting wrong? I was worried that it would stink, you know? <laughs> 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 yeah, it just wouldn't be any good. That it but, wouldn't be any good, that it wouldn't work as fiction. You know, I'd, I'd had oh, at that point, I guess, almost 15 years as a newspaper reporter. I knew how that worked. 
I wasn't sure. I, I think you saw me in the throes of writing my first nonfiction book, I, Nine Parts of Desire. That was when I learned a really crucial bit of information about how you sustain a long narrative, because up till then, a long narrative for me was 3,000 words. And you were living right next door and you were very industrious and, you know, you would be working really hard all day. And then it'd be 11 o'clock and Tony and I would be slumped in front of the TV watching the BBC and you'd go for a run. You'd be running at 11 o'clock and then you go back to work. And I remember you saw me swanning around Hampstead one day and said, that book's never going to get rid written unless you'd glue your bum to the chair. <laughs> Was I right? <laughs> you were so right. I mean, it's it's the necessary, if not the sufficient condition for getting a book written is gluing your bum to the chair. And so um, so learning how to write a long narrative in the two nonfiction books helped to take the leap into fiction, but I still wasn't sure. And I, I wrote three chapters from the beginning and then I wrote the ending and I sent it off to my nonfiction agent and I didn't hear anything from her for ages and I thought oh gosh she hated it and she's too polite to say and so I just you know went on with what, whatever else I was doing and then she calls me up one day and she says I've sold your book <laughs> and then I actually had to write the rest of it <laughs> <laughs> you you there's no reason you have to keep writing historical fiction what do you think keeps you going you could just make it all up why, I could, why but it's easier if pieces of history that... because I'm I'm a lazy sod, and it's easier if you find a story where you've got the architecture, you've got you've got the um, scaffolding, yeah. So you know what the arc of the story is, and you don't have to make everything up. You have to make up, you have to make up the missing pieces. So let's and, let's talk about this one. Let's talk about the, how this happened with this one. So yeah. start. Take me to the 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 very or the kind of the very beginnings of the idea. Like, how did it even cross your mind to be writing about racehorses in the nineteenth century? So I had just published Caleb's Crossing, and I got in, invited by Plymouth Plantation, which is a living history museum, to come to one of their donor lunches, and they'd been super helpful to me with the research on Caleb's Crossing, so I was glad to do it. I thought I was there to be chum in the water for the donors, you know, sit next to somebody with deep pockets and talk about how great the museum was as a research institution. But um, I'm sitting at the table, and Across and two seats down is an official from the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, and he's regaling his table mate with the story of how he has just transported the skeleton of the greatest racehorse of the 19th century from an attic in the Natural History Museum in Washington to be the centerpiece of a big exhibition at the International Museum of the Horse in Kentucky, because this particular stallion was not only blisteringly fast and broke every existing record on the track, he was also the leading stud stallion in American racehorse bloodlines. He, had, he, he begat more champions than any other horse. And then he turned to the, the story of what happened to this horse during the Civil War. And at that point, my lunch sat uneaten. And I was just to my companion, could you just quiet down? Because I just need to hear about this horse. So I went home pretty sure that was going to be my next book. So the first thing you heard about was the horse. The horse, exactly. And it was all about the horse. It was going to be all about the horse. That was what I thought setting out. And I was wrong. Yeah, well, just pause for a moment on the horse. Um, what did they know about, do they know much about what had happened to the horse? during? They the know everything about the horse because racing at that time in the 1850s and 60s was a national obsession, North and South. Everybody followed these great horses. There was huge prestige in having the top horse. It was- Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. And I didn't know how they, you know, racing was very different then. It was over four miles, which is like four times the Kentucky Derby. And, and the horses would do it three times in the one day. These were heat races. So the endurance of these horses was extraordinary. And, you know, of course, it was still a very agrarian society. Everybody had horses or they were 
were a few years away from having horses and and they were fascinated by breeding their fast horses and you know people would have informal quarter mile races right down the main street of of towns which is how we got the american quarter horse but these thoroughbred four mile horses were the ones that were the national obsession and every detail of every race there were three newspapers that just covered that so there was plenty of material on this horse people were obsessed with him he was such a celebrity this is a digression but there was some a question i had when i was when you were during the racing scenes you have the horse when the horse races against another horse or group of horses there are two there were two heats in the day they they raced twice or three times sometimes three times sometimes three times but the two the two well the two races i didn't understand because i couldn't figure out how they even figured out who won if Lexington won the first race and LeCompte or whatever the name horse's name won, won the second, what did they do? Yeah, I don't know what they did with that. That's a very good question. <laughs> you know, I'm very the mathematically point. challenged. Yeah, you, you win generally, the generally, they had three races okay. and sometimes they for the younger horses, they, they'd only be a short race of two miles, which is like two Kentucky Derbies. You know, All so. Right, so when you hear about this horse at this luncheon, I can see why you're mesmerized. Did you have an interest in horses? Oh, yeah. So th that that's the missing piece of the story. I had a late life. Mi my midlife crisis was falling into horse craziness. I went on a writer's conference in Santa Fe, and it was at this genteelly shabby, beautiful ranch. And my room just happened to be across from the corral where they had all these lovely Appaloosas and paints. And I was just looking at the horses and admiring them because I love animals. Yeah. And the wrangler said, you should come on a trail ride. And I said, I don't know how to ride. And he said, you don't need to. These horses know their job. I'll give you one that won't let you fall off. And the next day, I am cantering along the edge of an arroyo in a completely ecstatic state, just loving this. And I come home and I'm having dinner with a young friend a few nights later. And I tell her about how much I loved it. And she looked out the window at my place and said, you've got some land here. You could have a horse. In fact, I could give you my horse. And there were many questions I should have asked at that point, <laughs> but I did not. And I got a horse and that was all I wanted to think about. Caring for the horse, learning about horses, becoming a better rider, learning the horse anatomy, then learning my anatomy when I broke a rare bone in the pelvis that I didn't even know I had. And <laughs> <laughs> you keep the horse where you are right you're at your house in martha's vineyard is that where you kept the horse yes Just yes back? do you yes. still have do you still have a horse out there i do have a horse i rush to say it is a quieter smaller horse i found a better home for the horse uh that i got initially with a barrel racer because that horse just wanted to go and so now i have a nice quiet pony who's just happy to go on slow pokey trail rides with me so walk me just a bit further into your discovery of the story. You 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 hear you hear about Lexington at this lunch, and Lexington and every, they know everything about what happened to Lexington. And Lexington's skeleton is about to be exhibited in the Smithsonian. What do you do next? So then I start, you know, looking into the people around the horse, and that's when the story took an immense swerve because I learned about the absolutely indispensable role of the black horsemen who were the leading trainers and jockeys and grooms, and it was on their skilled labor that this incredibly important uh, lucrative and prestigious industry was based, and most of them were enslaved or formerly enslaved. The even the even in the north, uh, not in the north, but the you know Lexington is in the south, yeah, so no, I was no, really I just, following. I, I, I just meant you were talking about it was a national. Yeah, no, there were, there were black star trainers and and uh, jockeys in the north as well, but more so in the south. Huh. So it was really that the Southern industry was really built on the plundered labor of these men. Right. And how do you work that out? Where do you learn that? So some uh, some of the trainers uh, had quite a reputation and you will find them in the correspondence between the plantation owners. And they're talking about, you know, my great trainer hark or my great trainer charles and he says this that and the other thing and you can see these white men deferring to the expertise 
of of the black men, which is pretty unusual. And then I learned that that these skilled horsemen had a very unusual position within you know this brutal system, and that they had they had something that whites really really cared about, which was this skill. And so therefore they could. Uh, do things that other enslaved people couldn't do, like travel across state lines. They could uh, acquire some property, and many of them acquired enough to buy themselves out of enslavement, which was extraordinary. And yet they're still in this system where they can be ripped away from their family and sent off to work for somebody else, and they just have absolutely no agency in that way. So... You know, and it there are so many tragic stories that I uncovered while doing that research. So when you discover this, and as you say, the story takes a swerve, um, then you realize that you've got this character you're going to be drawing who's, who's voiceless like the characters from the plague, uh, from your plague town. This is, this is Jarrett. Jarrett. So Jarrett exists... Uh, existed. Uh, we can find him in the records of the farm manager because they started to pay him a salary after emancipation. And he's also in a painting of the horse, which is missing. And I, I hope it comes to light one of these days, but it's a painting by uh, a, a, an itinerant horse portrait artist who's also an important character in the novel. And it's supposed to be the best painting this guy did. And the title of it is Lexington being led out by Black Jarrett, his groom. And so I just started imagining who that young man might have been. Did, what evidence did you ha have that Jarrett was extremely important in Lexington's upbringing, development, all the rest? Just because I know how it works with horses. Mm -hmm. And the most important person is not who owns them. It's not even who trains them. It's the one who's there every morning with feed, mucking out their stall, grooming them. The grooms have the most intense relationship with the horses. And, and the, the people who do it really, really love the animals. They, you have to, and you have to have this intense bond with them. Do we know for how long the real Jarrett was attached to Lexington? Well, certainly for... Uh, all of his stud career for sure because he's in the farm records there but i suspect that he's also the person who's referred to as the darky who transports lexington from natchez to new orleans and that they're always talking about the darky groom the young darky so he that i think it's the same person um it's interesting the two there at what at, because you have more than one story going on rubbing yeah it's a side. it's a braided narrative in three time periods so and describe, I, describe why don't you tell i mean some of the people some of the audience would have read the book but just briefly describe the three time periods and so i always i always knew there'd be a contemporary story because i just wanted to get into the science at the smithsonian around this horse's skeleton and then i found out about the integral role of the horse portraitists. And there was this mysterious painting at the Smithsonian that came there as part of a bequest from an extremely unlikely source, this feminist radical art gallery owner from Manhattan in the immediate post-World War II period. And she was a great champion of Pollock and de Kooning and all these radical artists before they were famous. She supported them and uh, and promoted them and so she left a whole bunch of uh, artworks to the smithsonian and all of them are edgy contemporary art except for this one oil painting by thomas scott of lexington the horse and it's the only traditional little oil that she has this is not Why? this is not the painting that went missing this is a separate painting this is another one but right. by, so the same, by the same by the same painting. right hmm. they, yeah. they still have this and so the question was why did you i, I mean it was where, where you are drawing on the historical record and where you are making things up is so hard to determine if you're a reader. I mean, you, do, you make the stuff up so well that I, can't, I, can't, I couldn't tell where history stopped and Geraldine started. I can, uh, I can, I can I, give you, I'll guess, give you a clue. I could guess that Jared was largely drawn from your imagination. 
but because I thought, where where else would this come from? But give me so in the so well, I'm sorry to interrupt you. What were you going to say? No, the clue is if it's if it's really weird and unlikely, it's true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and that comes from Mark Twain's wonderful saying: uh, "Fiction is obliged to stick to possibilities; truth isn't." Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's <laughs> that. that that may be a bit of a key, but in in just like I was, I, I don't want to bounce around too much here. But but mm. for the three time periods for our audience, one is the 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 um, the period is immediately before and during and after the Civil War in the life of the horse, the life mm. of Lexington. The second time period is it's Martha Jackson, right? The the, mm -hmm. the art gallerist, dealer, yeah. gallerist who the art dealer in the fifties who somehow comes in possession of of this picture of Lexington. And I couldn't figure out, well, whether that's the story you tell of how she got it was concocted by you or that, that's actually what happened. No, it's concocted because I couldn't find out why she had it. But, you know, I do come clean about all this in the afterwards. So without okay. giving too much away, if you want to know where I've departed from the record, you'll find it there because I love it when novelists do that. So I always do that. And the, and the contemporary, tell me, tell a little, be honest, a little bit about the contemporary story. So the contemporary story was, I was attracted to it because it would give me a chance to get up in the business of a whole bunch of scientists and art conservators. And I love looking into other people's trades. And, uh, um, and then I realized that if I was going to tell this story about America's dark racist history, I couldn't leave that story in the past because it's not over. So that would have to echo in the present story as well. And and you're, and who do you use to create so that? I have two main characters in the present story. One of them is Jess, and she's uh, she's a, a zoologist and an osteopreparator who works at the Smithsonian and has a lab there. And the other is a young Nigerian American art historian who becomes obsessed with the portrayal of the black horseman in these paintings from the 19th century, because what is true about these paintings is they're very unusual depictions of enslaved people that portray them as very important individuals with a lot of dignity and authority. And so he's writing about that and their paths intersect. Um, the, uh, in addition to how you excel, at, at having the past talk to the present. And I love the way you use the bones and the paintings to link all periods. I mean, you've got these objects that are moving through space. Um, you, th this, th the border between the invented and the, and, and the actual is so extraordinary in the book. And the, there's a character, I thought there's no way this guy exists. Uh, and I went and Googled him. I started Googling the characters as I was reading because <laughs> I was so curious. I mean, it was, I mean, some of these characters are unbelievable, but this, I, I don't know how to pronounce his name. Is it Richard Tenbrook? Brook? Tenbrook. 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 Isn't he great? Isn't oh my he God. Just, and it, you Describe know. Describe him a little bit because when you Google him, what pops up is his obituary in some San, Fr San Francisco newspaper. And you read the obituary. It's unlike any obituary I've ever read. He was, a, he, he was an insane life, but insane life, you know, and I only get to tell uh, one chapter of it because, you know, he he sells Lexington at one point. But while he has the horse, he, he is an extraordinary guy. He he's from a very uh, important New York family, but he kind of blows himself up at West Point. Uh, and in murky circumstances, I went all the way out to West Point to research what had really happened and they had nothing. It was so disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he ends up making his fortune as a riverboat gambler and learning the thoroughbred industry. And then he buys Metairie Racecourse in New Orleans My and becomes your to... hometown. Yeah. I think, tur I think it's been turned into a graveyard. It was a graveyard. I think it's now a subdivision. <laughs> okay. okay. Right. But at the time it was, he, he turned it, he was a real empresario and he made it the most attractive race course in, in America of the time. And he had a woman's pavilion to attract ladies to the races and it had velvet drapes and gilt mirrors and the whole deal. And he was such a showman and he, he knew how to rev up 
a rivalry. So he, when he, he owns Lexington, he makes Lexington even more famous. And he just, he, he, he eggs his rivals on to these match races and he's, he's just brilliant. And then, you know, he sells Lexington and he goes off to England and has a whole second career there palling around with the Prince of Wales and makes and loses fortunes and dies in a lonely, lonely situation. His wife has left him and is ill and he's got no money and he's selling his trophies. The, the yeah. guy who comes, who finds his body alone in this bungalow is coming to buy the trophies from him so what? it's a very sad story <laughs> but, you, but you but you you i mean that you had to leave much of that out because your main character is jared and to the extent mm. that he it has nothing to do with jared has nothing to do with your story but what evidence did you have of the interaction between richard tenbrook and the and the groom i had no evidence so that is entirely concocted but it, it's based on what I was able to learn about the mannerisms and the character of Tenbrook and so I imagined if he had um, a relationship it would be something like that. Was he a, in the book he, he's you you're subtle about it but you suggest that maybe he was betting against his own horse. Oh I think there's, there's a lot of evidence that he did oh. yes yeah it's not that subtle. <laughs> You know, he's, such, he, he's a riveting character, but he's a completely familiar character to me because he could have walked out of the pages of The Big Short. <laughs> yes, yeah, very, right? very much so. Exactly, yes. it was, it, that he's exactly that character who's sort of yeah. looking at the world, seeing its folly and exploiting it yeah. and, and feeling and, and with a different emotional range than most people have. And you completely I mean I don't know who you were thinking about when you were writing it but when I was reading it I was thinking of those characters uh mm -hmm. that this this is it's a Wall Street character um you just he's just projected onto the world of horse racing because that's where a Wall Street character would be then that is exactly where they would be that was the big game at the time yeah um the all right so I, just a couple of more of the characters I'm just curious to hear you dilate a, a bit on um Cassius Clay Cassius Clay, what an extraordinary man. He is really something. So uh, everybody thinks of, of course, Muhammad Ali, but Muhammad Ali was named after the original Cassius Clay, who was a member of an extremely important political family in Kentucky, the Clay family, who, you know, um, didn't get to be presidents, but close by. And he was an unusual man for his time because he was an emancipationist and he freed all the enslaved people that he had inherited. And he had a newspaper called The True American where he sits in the middle of the slave power in Kentucky and preaches abolition, which led to him uh, ha having three attempts on his life by assassins. And he fought them off. People would come at him with guns and he would cut them at up with his Bowie knife. So he was really something. And he went off to be um, the ambassador to the court of the Tsar for Abraham Lincoln and was considered responsible, you know, for Russia's support of the Union during the Civil War. So he had quite the life. And he's married to the woman who whose father owned Lexington initially. So that's the um, way he walks into the story. The, the, but the cash, the, the, there's this wonderful um, sort of conflict in Cassius Clay it, in his theoretical feeling for um, uh, his feelings about slavery hmm. and his attitudes towards women don't hmm. don't seem to go together. <laughs> well, you know, he, he was uh, he was something so. His wife is left behind when he goes off to the Tsar's court and she manages to very astutely and shrewdly run his estates for him and renovate the mansion. And while he's away, he takes up with a Russian ballerina and comes back with his bastard son. <laughs> and she sends him to sleep in the unheated attic. <laughs> and they end up getting a divorce. And It's funny and how it's funny when it's 150 years ago, but if it happens to you, it's not so funny. Not so funny and, and not so funny in that she was then, you know, 
left with nothing because she had no property. Once you're married, you have no right to anything, even though she'd kept the estate running. And her daughter, Mary Barr, saw that and became a great feminist and suffragist and worked tirelessly to get women the vote because of what happened to her mother. So there are so many fascinating people attached to the story of this horse. Where did you feel you know, you talked about when you were writing about the plague that you were attracted to the silence of the of the past, the people who had no voice and left nothing behind. So you have a kind of responsibility to come in and fill in the blanks. Where did you find those the blanks most startling in this story? Oh, I think, you know, the stories of the enslaved who, generally speaking, very few had the opportunity to learn to read and write and tell their own story. But when when they did, they told those stories so eloquently, you know, the narratives of people like Frederick Douglass, you know, just so remarkable and Harriet Ann Jacobs. And so from the from the narratives that we have, you can you can learn such a lot about the emotional lives of people what do under we, this what system. Do we, what do we have from people who are actually in the role of, of grooming these horses? What, so what, is it, we, have, we don't have anything from the grooms. Nothing. Because they were not regarded, you know, even though they're fundamental. Uh, we have more from the trainers uh, and a little bit from the black jockeys, but there's one oral history uh, of a, a noted trainer but you have to take it with such a grain of salt because it's a it's a oral history taken by a white woman whose family had enslaved this man. So how frank can he really be about what happened with him? But even so, it's pretty riveting. I mean, it set my hair on fire reading his own words and even as much as he felt free to say to her was pretty striking. So. Isn't it remarkable that there are these people who are at the center of a national obsession, who are instrumental to success and failure, who are who remain invisible? Well, and also they were erased because after the Civil War, you know, the first Kentucky Derby, I think it was uh, 19 jockeys were black and the winner was Aristides, who was a son of Lexington trained by Ansel Williams, who was for a formerly enslaved black trainer, ridden by a black jockey. And yet 10 years later, 20 years later, there were no black jockeys for almost, I don't know, a century because they were pushed out sometimes violently and the whole racing industry became segregated. And all this talent and skill, uh, some, some of the jockeys went to other countries to pursue their craft and others just died penniless. When does that happen? When does that happen? It happens in the backlash to reconstruction. Right, right. But pretty quickly, very quickly. Before we, I'm gonna take some questions from the audience, but um, before we do that, a couple of things. First is you look at horse racing today, how's it different from horse racing, the horse racing you're describing? It's, it's much rougher on the horses. I, I, I feel that, you know, the, the um, animal welfare issues in, in contemporary racing are really critical because so many horses die on the track. Uh, and if they don't, they're often uh, discarded and have their lives end pretty horribly at the age of about five. And anyone who's been with horses and knows anything about horses is that you shouldn't really ride them properly until they're five. And yet in racing, they're ridden hard as two-year-olds when their bones aren't even finished growing. And then if they don't make it, they're just thrown away and end up, you know, in the knackery a lot of times they're being shipped to Mexico for dog food. And I, they're beautiful animals. So my, my horse has a has a pasture mate whose name is Screaming Hot Wings. <laughs> and he is an off the track racehorse thoroughbred. And um, my neighbor acquired him when he was five years old and he's now 33 and he's still got so much to give. And so I just think it's tragic that these horses, so many of them are just discarded because of money and you know, disregard. Why would they be racing them 
before they're really ready to race. Why did the market do that? I don't know why the market did that. They're very fast at that age. You know, you can get a lot of speed out of them. And I guess that's what that's all that people care about. But in this country, particularly, it's illegal. Most places they pump them full of a drug called Lasix, which makes their bones grow faster. But it also makes them more subject to injury and breakdown. And uh, it's really horrible. You know, you just you see so many horses destroyed on the track. Santa Anita is notorious for losing these beautiful horses. So the other thing that was on my mind as I was reading your book was Tony, um, uh, who died while you were working on the book. Yeah, Tony Howitz, my partner in love and life. And, um, and my close friend. Yes, your close friend and, and a great collaborator. And he loved this project. He, um, he had been a little, uh, a little, less interested in when I went into biblical myth and history in the secret chord, he couldn't care less about that, but he loved this period so much. And he would bring me just fantastic little nuggets that he found in the archives because he's the real historian in the family and he knows what he's doing. <laughs> so he would come and drop something wonderful on my desk. And then we did this wonderful research trip to Kentucky together because our research overlapped. He was working on a book called Spying on the South about the travels of Frederick Law Olmsted just before the Civil War, uh, trying to investigate why the country was so divided. And Tony retraced his steps asking the same question just before the election of Donald Trump. And so there are a lot of really great memories um, of that trip. We took our youngest son with us and Tony, as was his want, was teasing that kid the whole way. And <laughs> we had... How close did your research come to each other? Did Olmsted wander through your world? Yes, he did. He did very much so. And it's pretty clear that he uh, met Cassius Clay for one thing, because he was so interested in, in you know, the institution of slavery and, and the incredible unwillingness of Southerners to countenance that this was, you know, in any way the wrong the wrong path for the nation. And, uh, and so, um, yeah, our, our research did overlap and the, many of the same people and certainly reading Olmsted's writing was helpful to get a picture of what Kentucky was like at exactly that time. I, when I was reading the book, I felt like I was stumbling upon the fingerprints of your grief um, yeah. in, in lots of moments. There, there are exceptions, but I, I think most of the main characters are, have, have, have or have experienced or are going to experience loss. And I'm wondering, did, were you aware of the role loss, the feelings of loss was, were kind of playing in the book as you were writing it? So Tony died so suddenly. And for a year, I couldn't even look at this book. I just had to set it aside, partly because I just didn't have the ability to focus and partly because I was just overwhelmed with, you know, trying to figure out how my life worked without him. Uh, and um, I think when I went back to it, I was a different person and I understood loss and grief in a more visceral way than I had before, before it was something I imagined. And when I came back to the book, it was something I knew. And um, I'm sure you feel that way too because I feel that way too and I know I know yeah. exactly what you're saying and it and it's it's really evident in the way you wrote it it's really there's a moment I'm trying to remember what it was that Jarrett lost it might have been his father uh but there's a moment when he he recognizes a change in himself um that 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 uh felt very familiar to me mm. um yeah. we should give because uh, we have a few, just a few minutes. There are a few mm -hmm. questions in here, and a lot of them are just like, they just want to know a couple things. So mm -hmm. it, it kind of quick. But you mentioned the, the name of the author you mentioned at the beginning who meant, who meant a lot to you, Mary Mary Renault. Mary Renault liked the car. Okay, Mary Renault. Someone wants to know how, how much, kind of the role serendipity plays in, in your discovery of your next book, in your discovery of material that you want to write, write about. It, big or little? 
Uh, huge. Absolutely. It's, it's completely by chance. It, it almost always has been. Um, Hemingway said an idea for a book can be something you're lucky enough to overhear or the wreck of your whole damn life. <laughs> <laughs> lucky for me, it tends to be things I overhear or stumble upon. I'm the same way. I mean, they're just the things walk in and, and mm -hmm. you just have to be open to them. That's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, it, and th sometimes it's hard to stay open to them because <laughs> you forget how you discovered your last book. It's well, you know, I always think it's like um, when you're in a relationship that's kind of getting to the end of its life, then you go to a party with that person and then you see the really handsome dude across the room <laughs> and you think, <laughs> you think that one. Is that happening? That one, to you, that's, what? <laughs> what? that happen to you? Hey, back in the day, you know. <laughs> That one's that relationship's going to be perfect and it'll be simple. And, and it's the same with a book idea. When you get the idea, it's this bright, shiny thing. And it's not like the one you're working on, which is full of difficulty and struggle. And so you think once I get to that new idea, it's just going to go so easy. And it's just like the dude, you know, he moves in and he starts dropping his wet towels on the bathroom floor, just like the last one. Yes. The, your, your book <laughs> ideas never, never do the dishes. <laughs> that, they never do the dishes. It's, They're never easy. They're never, They're never easy. easy. So yeah. um, someone wants to know if Martha, the gallery owner, was based on Betty Parsons. No, no, it's Martha Jackson. She that, was, that, yeah, yeah, she was a hundred percent real person. And many of the details in that section are true, except for why she had the painting, which I wasn't able to determine. So I had to make something up. Did she really trade Jackson Pollock? for the car and give him the car in which he killed himself she did you artfully <laughs> boy yeah I, i'll never look at jackson pollock the same way uh so <laughs> so um what i mean what, that was the weirdest thing about this book that this horse had a connection even to jackson pollock <laughs> it's you, the horse touches everything mm. because you've got the skeleton you've got these paintings it's uh it's um so why don't we wrap up with the last question? And it's a hard question. Uh, and it's a question that I wondered about when I went, someone wants, uh, Stephanie Schiff wants you to talk more about why you thought the contemporary story was so important. And did you worry at all about how readers and critics would react to Theo and his fate? Yeah, I was, I, I, and I'm still, uh, worried because I'm very aware of the discourse about appropriation and who has the right to tell stories of people other than your own background. Um, so yeah, I was very concerned about it. I knew that there was going to be a contemporary thread because I wanted to write it that way. I wanted the science at the Smithsonian to be part of the story. But once I had a contemporary thread, the jackhammer outside our door, the whole time I was writing this thing, was the white supremacist messages that were coming from the White House and the horrible sequential deaths of George Floyd and Ahmed Arbery and Breonna Taylor and lots of other names that we don't know as well, but we should. And it's just like, a, you know, there's a certain um, point of view in this society that slavery is over and done with and I don't have any responsibility for that. And so why should I think about reparations? And it's, you know, we're post-racial. Well, we're not, we are not post-racial. And this is something that is still uh, a reckoning that this country has to deal with. So I couldn't leave that out of the story. No, you really couldn't leave it out of the story. The minute you had a contemporary story that was gonna speak to this story from the past, you had no choice. That's what I, that's what I determined. Yeah. And I also couldn't, you know, I could have written this book focused on Tenbrook and Warfield and all the white characters, but that would be wrong to me because that would be once again, erasing the role, the absolutely crucial role of, of the black horseman. And I didn't want to do that either. Right. So I just had to walk into the bandsaw and hope for the best. Well, you're going to get cut up a little bit, but that's all right. It was worth it. The book's wonderful. I mean, it's just great. I, I, I'm so proud of you. I, I know, I know, because I've seen you just kind of just flourish as in this whole other career that you, that was wholly unnecessary. You could have just gone and become, been a great journalist for the rest of your life, and instead you did this. 
And I, I don't know, it's inspiring. And I think that I have a sense of how much courage it took to write this. Uh, I mean, that you had to fight through a lot of emotion to get to it. And, uh, and that's not easy. You had to put your bum in the chair. And, uh, yeah. and I'm proud of you for doing that. So we're gonna turn it back over to Julie, who's gonna come in and say some kind words. Thank and you. we are so glad that she did make that shift, right? <laughs> Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Michael, Geraldine, this has been a great conversation. Thank you both so much for your time. Um, of course, number three on the New York Times bestseller list. Let's keep it there. If you haven't already bought it, three great bookstores, Elliott Bay, Warwick's, and Book Passage all have some signed copies. So I think it'll be a good thing. Can't wait to see you all in person next book. Come to come to the West Coast. Maybe you and Michael could take a trip and come out here together. We could do this in, in the real world, right? <laughs> well, that, that sounds ideal. Great. I love it. Comes, I'll be there. There you go. Michael, thank you for your time. Geraldine, thank you as always. Everyone have a great evening. All right, thank bye -bye. you so much, guys.